I'm really glad you all could come, and I'm really glad the panelists could come. Um, and a special good morning to the webcast people and those of you who are watching the webcast down the road. Um, very briefly, the Woodrow Wilson Center is the United States Memorial to our 28th president, our only president with a PhD. And uh, so we have a research institution, not a block of marble on the mall. The Canada Institute uh, <coughs> tries to promote the looking at Canada in Washington among policymakers. Not always an easy task, but we try to pick issues that get people's attention. This certainly does. Um, why we picked today was because we could get the, our two authors <coughs> of our One Issue, Two Voices, which put out this was originally the publication launch for this. this um, Normally we try to do it when it comes out. This came out in September, but Laura's on the road a lot, and Chris Sands is on the road a lot, and this is the day that worked. And it also happened to be just about the one-year anniversary of the signing of the uh, Beyond the Border Action Plan, the Regulatory Cooperation Council Action Plan. So it's great. Now the reports aren't out as <coughs> scheduled. They will be out soon, I'm told, but we're going to go ahead with the discussion today anyway. Um, we had great programs over the summer in July when we looked at the six months uh, of the Regulatory Cooperation Council and the uh, Beyond the Board Action Plan, and we had stakeholders then. Great session then. We're bringing back some of our speakers from that, that panel um, for an uh, in-depth <coughs> discussion to see what happened over the last six months. <coughs> um, so we've got some stakeholders today. Our uh, first panel will have Michael Fitzpatrick from General Electric and Kelly Johnson from Campbell Soup Company, and Laura Dawson, our Canadian author from the One Issue, Two Voices publication, will moderate this session. After the break, we'll look at Beyond the Border Action Plan. Teresa Brown, um, <coughs> over here in the corner, will give an overview of what has and has not happened in government circles, and David Goldstein of the Tourism Industry of Association of Canada, and Bridget Matithen, Matheson of Canadian ex Manufacturers and Exporters <coughs> will give the stakeholder view. Chris Sands, who is our American author of the One Issue, Two Voices piece, will moderate. And then after that, we'll do a quick uh, session with Chris and Laura, who will discuss their paper. Paul Fraser, who was the co American co-chair of the Canada Institute's advisory board, will moderate that session and bring in some of the discussion from the morning and have a discussion with Chris and Laura. So we do hope to have plenty of time for discussion. The audience was a really important part of the July programs, and we hope it will be today. Um, I would also point you to our blog, it's on Beyond the Border Observer, listed on the back of page of this, where we've got all the documents that have come out. We're using this as a repository for everything that comes out, so it'll be in one place. Uh, not everyone speaks to each other, and it's a good place to look for documents. Additionally, if you're involved in the, uh, the RCC part of this, um, Adam Schlosser at the U.S. Chamber, um, sort of leading up a group looking at, at stakeholders and that, and uh, sort of a, a separate little group. We've got a statement going. Um, if you're not involved with that group, I suggest you see Adam at the break or afterwards. Um, it's, uh, it's a good discussion uh, at parallel to what we're doing here. So with that, let me turn it over to Laura, and we're off. Thank you, David. And thank you, too, to the Canada Institute and the Woodrow Wilson Center for really taking a leadership role on this issue. This is uh, the unsung hero of Canada-US relations, and it's not sexy at all. Regulatory cooperation is about the least exciting topic that we could be discussing. Let me give you a little bit of background. I used to be a professor of Canada-US international trade in Canada. Um, I was, although I'm a Canadian, I was also an advisor on Canada-U.S. trade issues at the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa. And I was also a uh, public policy scholar here at Woodrow Wilson at the Canada Institute. Um, and what I've learned through that process is that the sign of a mature, integrated trading relationship isn't the big, sexy intention to negotiate. Uh, isn't the about to sign an agreement. I guarantee you if this was a meeting about Brazil or China or currency manipulation or the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we would be standing room only. But this is, ladies and gentlemen, the most important Canada-U.S. economic initiative currently on the books. And the Canada-U.S. trading relationship is the largest 
tra bilateral trading relationship in the world, and it is the most important relationship for both of our two countries. More than a billion dollars a day in two-way trade, more than 350,000 land border crossings by people. This is advanced level management. When we start to do trade agreements, we start with the easy stuff. It's like draining a bathtub or maybe draining a harbor, you know. You start with the tariffs. And the tariffs aren't really that hard. You negotiate, you reduce. You negotiate, you reduce. As the tariffs go down, you get to the non-tariff barriers. They're a lot harder. And sometimes there's a constituency to push them down, and sometimes there's not. When you get to the really difficult stuff, regulatory cooperation, standards, technical barriers, rules of origin, you're really down in the muck. And what happens is the bigger companies can often find a workaround for these things. Everybody has to pay probably 5-8% of their transaction value on regulatory and border barriers. But the big companies find a workaround. The smaller companies are the ones who just can't do it. They're the ones who just can't engage in two-way trade because there's some thing that just prevents them from taking the next step. Um, I was just at, at a meeting uh, with Chris in, in Idaho where uh, an exporter was complaining that she has a product that goes from Los Angeles or goes from Vancouver to Los Angeles. She's selling it through e-commerce. It's a very exciting you know, uh, product. People want it. And she wants to ship it 24-hour delivery. Well, you can't because there isn't an FDA inspection that can guarantee 24-hour turnaround on the West Coast. So to go from Vancouver to LA, you have to go to Louisville, Kentucky. And oh, by the way, the FDA inspection isn't even done in person. It's done remotely. So somebody from Connecticut is just reading a screen in Louisville in order to get that product back to Los Angeles. This is the sort of stuff that we're talking about. And the NAFTA was important, but the NAFTA only took us so far. Um, this is the next steps. This is where dis we're discussing, uh, you know, sexy, interesting issues like uh, uh, chrysanthemum rust, meat cut nomenclature, uh, nanotechnology, pesticide residue, and I'll you know, guarantee you, those of you who aren't in the government, you don't want to go to your minister, your, your leader, your president and say, we're going to have a, a North American leaders meeting and we're going to discuss poultry wash. <laughs> Nobody wants to do that. But we've had some really strong leadership um, coming out of both the Canadian and the U.S. government. They've worked together in a, in a great partnership, I would say. And more importantly, we have had strong business support for this. The business community has come forward and said, yes, we're interested in this, and we're doing, willing to do the work on these tiny micro issues in order to make it better, more effective for everyone, and in doing so, building North American competitiveness. You're going to hear far too much from me, so I'm going to uh, end off with that, and you'll hear some more remarks a bit later when Chris and I talk. But I think we're just extremely lucky this morning that we've got uh, Kelly Johnson and Michael Fitzpatrick here. They are, in their uh, own ways, on the vanguard of this issue. Um, uh, Kelly is um, <coughs> with, sorry, I'm going to go in a different order. Michael, uh, Michael Fitzpatrick uh, is the senior manager and senior counsel for regulatory affairs at General Electric which is one of the big, important players in Canada-U.S. relations because they have so much stake on, on both sides of the border. I know Michael because he used to be uh, at OMB OIRA. He was the second to Cass Sunstein, and he's really the daddy of regulatory cooperation. And on a, a, a snowy day in Ottawa two years ago, he came up and suggested the Canadians, maybe we should do this. Are you all interested? And the Canadians said, oh, yeah, I think so. That was, the, that was the easy part. The hard part has been everything else since. And oh, by the way, we're supposed to be getting the one-year progress report any minute now. So hopefully what we say is congruent with that. Um, so uh, through Kelly's work as the, the lead on the RCC, uh, Canada-US Regulatory Cooperation Council, and now through his vantage point uh, as a senior executive at General Elect uh, Electric, I think he brings great um, uh, insight uh, on this process. And I'm going to give you a quick introduction again to, to Kelly because uh, he, again, is from one of those companies that is so key to the success of keeping Canada-U.S. trade relations on a high-level political agenda. Um, uh, being the Vice President for Government Affairs at Campbell Soup, 
everybody knows and loves Campbell's soup. Most people don't realize. <laughs> mm -hmm, good. Most people don't realize it is one of the most integrated bilateral companies in the world. Um, in terms of Canada-US relations, and if it wasn't for folks like Kelly that come to these meetings tirelessly and say, yes, this is important, yes, differences in size and shape and certification and inspection make a difference to us, then this would be back down at the bottom of the bin of stuff that leaders don't want to talk about. So our approach this morning is I'm going to turn the microphone over first to Michael and uh, hear some remarks from him, and then Kelly, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A from you guys, and we'll go straight through till about 10 o'clock. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Kelly, always good to be uh, on a panel with you. And thanks uh, to the Wilson Center and the Canada Institute for doing, uh, uh, for do, for doing this uh, event. Uh, it's important that institutions like uh, the Wilson Center and the Canada Institute continue to shine a light on this important work uh, because, as Laura says, it isn't the sexiest thing, although I think it's a little bit hot, just a little bit. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it doesn't always get the attention that it deserves. But uh, international regulatory cooperation, regulatory, regulatory coherence is ascendant. And so it is becoming, I think, more and more acknowledged to be the gritty but critical work that needs to be done to uh, expand global trade and to expand economies and create jobs. And I think, you know, this administration uh, has uh, been in the lead of that. I think they realized, maybe not early on, but a year or two into their term, first term, that the trade levers uh, are actual levers that they can pull to try to uh, catalyze economic growth. Uh, there are so many levers that, unfortunately, in this city today, and, and, and in terms of macroeconomic forces, they can't pull. Uh, but but this, is, this is one of them. And so you've seen an increasing this is a bipartisan issue, an increasing emphasis on international regulatory cooperation. You now see it as perhaps the critical provision that would be in a US-EU um, uh, agreement, uh, economic agreement, trade agreement. I think it'll be broader than trade. You see it as a key piece of the Canada-EU uh, free trade agreement, which we hope is resolved soon because US-EU can't really get started till that one uh, completes. You see it as a critical chapter in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, Chapter 3. For the first time, you actually have a better regulation, regulatory process chapter in a trade agreement. This is extraordinary. So ac around the globe, you're seeing greater and greater emphasis on this issue. I, I think in many ways, the RCC remains with, um, re with some concerns and some, some scars or warts or whatever you want to call them uh, that, that we'll talk about one of the best examples of successful regulatory cooperation. In only two years, you have gone from nothing, in fact, more than nothing, a general malaise and bad taste over the last effort several years ago, to what is, I think, still the most vibrant, energetic regulatory cooperation effort underway. Um, you have working groups, scores of working groups, working on 29 individual initiatives across the agencies and ministries in both countries. You have the President and the Prime Minister continuing to emphasize this as a priority. Uh, and you are now starting to get, finally, some output from the process. So um, I, I applaud the work that's being done in the RCC. I am wary and cautious in that there's a tendency in these types of efforts for there to be um, a sort of a, 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 a loss of momentum and energy. It's, it's human nature. It's, it's the grind of, of, tough, of tough negotiation and work. It's the imposition of this responsibility with no added resources to the regulators on both sides. So understand, this dropped on them from out of the sky at, a, at the same time in the U.S. that their budgets are under pressure and being cut. So uh, th there, there is a real struggle here to do this in addition to everything else that they're already being asked to do. Uh, but let me, let me start with some good news and then I'll get to some continuing concerns and what we can all do about it. The good news is this indisputably remains a top three priority for the Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, we were up in Ottawa a couple weeks ago at the Canadian American Business Council, uh, Lollapalooza, which uh, <laughs> Kelly and I both sit on the board. Uh, it was a fantastic all-day event. 
uh, which uh, highlighted the RCC, um, um, among other things. And the Prime Minister emphasized again that this is top tier for him. That's critical because that flows into the U.S. and keeps kind of the U.S. energized about it. Uh, you have two ambassadors in Gary Dorr and David Jacobson who are fully engaged on this and are tremendous. They're both tremendous people and they are fully engaged in pushing this forward. I think that helps immensely and they like each other and they work well together. So it's really a very synergistic uh, relationship there with, with the ambassadors. You've got work progressing, so stuff is happening. Now it may not always be as transparent or as quick uh, as we all would like out in the stakeholder community, but it is happening. And for the first time, uh, Jeff Weiss, who is the, the, the new or not so new associate administrator at OIRA, and David Maloney, uh, who's now heading both BTB and RCC for Canada, uh, read out some progress, some, so, some actual outputs from the process at the CABC meeting. Now, we're all anxiously anticipating the report so we can sort of have a, formal, a formalization of those items that were uh, completed and hopefully the announcement of some additional items. And what I've encouraged them to do is also preview some that you think are almost there but would be forthcoming soon. I mean, always use the opportunity to give people <laughs> truthful uh, readouts that, that, that indicate that we're on the cusp of more progress because that, that fuels stakeholder enthusiasm and, and, and continued engagement. Um, now, uh, is issues of, of concern or issues to be watched. As I said, there's, in, in the life cycle of any big intergovernmental effort, there's always the, um, there's always the midlife crisis, right? So um, regulators here, um, you know, maybe running out and buying convertibles and <laughs> doing other things, uh, you know, maybe they shouldn't be doing. And, and we want to watch that because it's, it's, it's hard. They're, they're in the second, now into the third year of this. And this is where, this is where the tough issues come up. This is where they're at a little bit of loggerheads with their counterpoints. And they, they thought they had a path forward and now they're realizing they don't or now they have other exigencies, other, other priorities that are being thrust upon them in their day-to-day -day work, and, they, and they're losing a little bit of focus. And so, to me, it's, 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 always, it's, it's, it's always toughest in that middle, that middle chapter of the three chapters, right? Um, where, you know, the first chapter, everybody's excited, everybody's in love, everybody's having a great time, you know, they're throwing themselves into it. The last chapter, you see maybe the finish line, and so you've got that extra energy to get there, that's that middle phase where it's just a slog every day. And so that's where we are right now. And I think we need to help push them along. So the business community, the stakeholder community needs to stay engaged in a constructive way um, and, and, and we need to uh, continue to push. Communications and transparency. Uh, that is a fundamental process issue. I continue to think that they could do better in pushing information out to the stakeholder community and to the public about what's happening um, and to provide a, an easy ability for stakeholders to stay engaged and provide input. The way this will work is if the regulators go in with good faith to solve a, a, a problem, which I think they're doing, we wouldn't have put any of the 29 items on the action plan if there wasn't already high-level political buy-in at each agency or ministry and a sense that there was a path forward and something was achievable. So that was, that was the touchstone. That, that, was, that was the filter. Uh, but regulatory cooperation is a funny thing. Normally, when regulators regulate, they are regulating for the benefit of the, the masses, right? They're benefiting for the benefit of the citizens. The benefits are dispersed broadly. And the costs do fall on a smaller group. It's, it's internalizing externalities. It's, it is the fact that, that stakeholders often you know, bear the costs, uh, the business community. This is different. This is where there's a sense, a trust, that the society is not going to suffer. There's going to be no disbenefits in terms of protection but there's going to be a benefit to the business community, which is going to be passed through them back to the citizens through more jobs, lower prices, 
economic growth generally, right? So it is actually a, let's, we shouldn't be defensive about this. We should be very upfront. This is a collaboration between regulators and, this, and the regulated community to relieve regulatory burdens without jeopardizing protections and then having the business community pass through the benefits to people. And when we think about it in that sense, it's real important that the solution benefits the business community. Because if it doesn't, there's no pass through to the citizens and we've just wasted a whole bunch of people's precious time. So I, I think in these processes, it's especially important that the stakeholder community is involved all on the way and is able to make ensure that the solution that comes out the back end is really going to reduce the non-tariff barriers, really going to reduce burdens, and allow them to pass through the benefits. And I'm almost done. Uh, the, uh, we, we need results. So there's now uh, glimmers of hope on the results front that we're starting to get readouts of actual outputs coming out of this, this effort, I would hope that over the next six months to a year, we'll really see a ramping up of that and more and more substantive achievements that will continue to validate the process. Uh, on my last point, by the way, Adam Schlosser from the Chamber has organized a uh, stakeholder communications <laughs> council um, uh, or connect connectivity council. I don't know what SCC really stands for, but the bottom line is that a whole bunch of trades and a whole bunch of businesses have teamed up with the chamber to create sort of an ombudsman role, which is in a very constructive and respectful way going to take input from the business community and pass it through to the RCC folks and, and try to increase connectivity, communication, transparency. Um, last, a couple points. One, uh, uh, opportunities for new action items. I think this is critical. The RCC was always envisioned to have sort of two, um, uh, two characteristics. One was a pretty tight two-year time frame from when it was launched, and I think it was really launched last winter um, when actual work began, okay? So, so the idea was we didn't want to sit around and talk to each other for five years and not get anything done. There was a proof of concept of about two years, so stuff has to get done in the next year. Uh, but second, the idea was with the hope that it would be successful, this should turn into an organic long-term process whereby new items could continually cycle on to the agenda and be addressed. And that hasn't happened yet. I'm not being critical, but I'm hopeful that in this report and over the next quarter or two, you're going to see a mechanism by which companies can suggest new ideas for inclusion. So let me take GE as an example. We care about this because we care about international regulatory cooperation, liberalizing trade, and reducing non-tariff barriers. But we don't really care that much about the RCC action items yet because we don't have any of the 29 that really go to our core businesses and our core issues. Um, but we have four ideas in the energy and healthcare area. If we could have a path forward to suggest these four to the RCC, and hopefully one, two, three, or even four would be accepted, as action items, all of a sudden GE as a company is now fully engaged, and that's good for the RCC. So the more you can expand the opportunity for new items to come onto the agenda, the broader the stakeholder support and the broader the and more intense the momentum behind the effort. Uh, so uh, I'll stop there. Th those are my thoughts on um, success to date and um, issues in the future. I, I, I do, though, want to applaud the folks who are working very hard every day on the RCC. I think they're doing, um, they're doing a good job. Thanks. They're doing a great job. Thank you so much. That was terrific. Um, and what you said about the importance of stakeholders and stakeholder participation um, is, is key. And we have had a number of Canada-U.S. initiatives, um, uh, security, prosperity, partnership, et cetera, et cetera, things that have kind of fallen by the wayside. And some of our stakeholders may have been getting a little cynical, a little, so what's next? So I'd like to turn it over to, to Kelly Johnson to talk about the stakeholder perspective and how it has been in the trenches on this issue. Well, Laura, thank you very much. And David, thank you as well for having this uh, little anniversary session for the uh, BTB. Uh, have, by the way, happy triple 12 day. You knew that was coming, right? <laughs> okay, I had to oh my mention God. that as well. <laughs> I'm suddenly nervous, Kelly. <laughs> Doesn't mean anything. Um, as Laura mentioned, I'm uh, here on behalf of Campbell Soup Company, and, and uh, Campbell is a good example of a company that operates uh, 
predominantly in North America. Uh, we're international, of course, but uh, we have operations in 14 states and Ontario. We have five major, we call thermal plants for our soup, sauce, and beverage facilities, and we treat our Toronto plant on the same basis as we treat our Napoleon, Ohio, uh, California, and North Carolina facilities, part of the same highly integrated network. My favorite story to just talk about how often we take, just, uh, take uh, for, if you will, take for granted the relationship and the integration of our markets is my own CEO, Denise Morrison. When Denise was asked to be on the President's Export Council earlier this year, she said, well, I don't know if I really should do that because we really don't export a whole lot. We tend to make it where we sell it. And I had to remind her, well, actually, we do export to Canada. And she goes, oh, because we see U.S. and Canada as a single market. And so it's not really exports to us when she realized that. And, and as a result of that discussion and her membership on the Export Council, she has made Beyond the Border her top priority. And, and it always raises questions with cabinet secretaries and tries to keep us front and center at the very highest levels and been very supportive of this uh, from the very, very beginning. So because uh, Michael's exactly right, and I agree with everything Michael said, so I'm going to be a little bit briefer than I had planned to be, which is good for you. We have more time for Q&A. Uh, I would have preferred that we had the report to leaders out today. I mean, I would have had a lot more to discuss, and I'm told there's going to be some, quote, good news for my sector. I will tell you that when, when Mike talks about and Lori talks about the fact that, that this is a slog, it really is, and all you have to do is look at trade negotiations around the world and where do they typically get hung up? Food and ag issues almost every time. Uh, NAFTA, U.S., Australia free trade agreements always get hung up on some issue, whether it's sugar reform or whatever. Um, even though NAFTA is, is clearly one of the most successful free trade agreements in the world, uh, there are still lots of things in there that it does not include, including in the food and ag space. So I, this area is particularly difficult when it comes to regulatory cooperation. Uh, and a good example of that is something that actually is not part of Beyond the Border program, but, but I think is, is, was prompted by it. And that's when the Prime Minister, as part of his budget uh, submission earlier this year, proposed the elimination of Canada's very unique container can size regulations. Now, here's where you all start to eyes glaze over a bit, and, and we talk about sexy items here. Uh, and that was when, when this was announced a year ago, it was a can of Campbell Canadian soup was put on the front page of some of the newspapers as an example of where there are regulatory differences. Well, members of my own industry in Canada came out strongly opposed to, re to trying to repeal those regulations. And uh, so some of my own peer companies, because they're fearful of job loss and, and without providing any shred of evidence that Canada's unique container can size regulations protect jobs in Canada, uh, it just shows that there's going to be some friction with many of these issues, it's especially one what I consider to be very low-hanging fruit. Uh, so it just shows you that this is going to be difficult to do, but we are making great progress. And actually, I would say the progress that we've experienced, at least in my sector, hasn't been a result yet of the Beyond the Border program per se, but the result, the relationships and other activities around it have been evident of that. And I'll give you some examples. I, container can size regulations in Canada being one. With the, the Prime Minister said, you know what, this makes sense, we're going to repeal these. And it will happen, <coughs> although it's been delayed a little bit uh, uh, on behalf of some of my colleagues in the food industry. Uh, Canada just recently passed a Safe Food Act which is based uh, and very similar to, not identical to, but, but some has some, some similarities to the U.S. Food Safety Modernization Act that was signed into law a couple of years ago. And as a result of the work, I think, of Beyond the Border, we now have agencies realizing, oh, if we're going to implement regulations to, in the U.S. on food safety, then Canada needs a similar framework and do it at the same time. So we're actually seeing now two countries working very closely together on food safety regulation trying to synergize, if you will, or harmonize to, do, to a degree some of the same regulatory requirements and standards and as they both modernize their food safety systems. So that's, that's great news. Uh, now, have we seen the regulations yet? No, because they're going to come out soon in the U.S. and Canada just passed their law. So this will work uh, hand in hand. And, uh, but I think this is a good sign that this is bigger than just beyond the border. This is really trying to enhance improved coordination on several regulatory fronts that will, I think, result uh, in, in protecting, if not in actually enhancing standards, at the same time making our regulatory systems much more efficient, helping to lower our cost as well. Uh, in fact, one of the frustrations that we've had is that you've got two very unique food safety 
uh, infrastructures and government between the U.S. and Canada. Canada has, a, has Health Canada and a single food inspection agency, the CFIA. In the U.S., we have a 1930 structure that's highly uh, fractured and, and highly prescriptive. We have the Food and Drug Administration, which gets 20% of our nation's food safety resources to regulate 80% of the food supply. And then you have the U.S. Department of Agriculture with a very different system that gets 80% of our resources on food safety to regulate 20% of the food mm -hmm. supply. And so, and, and both of them have very different basis for how they operate. Uh, you have continuous inspection at USDA for any products uh, like meat and poultry, but even, even canned meat and poultry products. A can of Campbell chicken noodle soup has the USDA regulatory seal of approval. The can of the double noodle soup of Campbell soup has the FDA's uh, seal of approval. And so even there you have some differences that makes it frustrating, I'm sure, for Canada to figure out, well, who am I supposed to talk to here on, on this one issue? Because the, the standards and, and regulatory programs are, are actually very, very different in some respects. So that's why I was very excited when the president last year came out with a request to give him the authority to reorganize federal agencies because that would allow him to address some of these problems to a degree. It's going to require legislation eventually to address the U.S. food safety system. That's why we've seen proposals uh, for a single food safety system. I actually think the U.S. should adopt Canada's model. While it's not perfect, it's better than what we have in the U.S. in terms of a single food inspection agency with another agency setting standards. It would sure make it much easier for us to have a more integrated, more, uh, more harmonized, and higher level of cooperation between our two, our two systems. Um, uh, I totally agree with, with Michael's comments on uh, the stakeholder engagement issue. I do think that, that there has been a very big difference between what we saw with the Security and Prosperity Partnership uh, engagement back in the um, about five, six years ago when it first was launched by previous presidents and prime ministers and, uh, and the head of Mexico. Uh, and now, because the, it's, it, there was a process set up then for stakeholder engagement, there hasn't really been one with the Beyond the Border program. So I do think there needs to be some improvement. And I, again, I also applaud Adam and the Chamber for what they're doing, trying to improve stakeholder engagement. I also want to thank uh, Bridget at, for folks at the, uh, at the CME in Canada and the NAM in the U.S. who have a Business, business for Better Borders coalition that we're part of as well. Those are good, and those have helped to, to help bring attention to this. But I do hope that we will see more stakeholder engagement, more communication. I know the folks in Canada have had webinars and whatnot that have really helped facilitate the flow of information and input. We haven't had the same degree of that in the U.S. I'd like to see that. But by and large, uh, what I hear, and I know they're working, that th we have a much higher level of agency cooperation at the U.S. than we had under the SPP. So there's clearly going to be some progress. I'm looking forward, and I hear there's going to be some good news in the final report. So um, I know there's a little bit of frustration with the uh, by regulators with U.S. companies. Uh, why aren't we more engaged? Why haven't we submitted more information? Because we, you know, I think right now it's a kind of a wait and see approach. It's true because after all the work that many of us did on the SPP, we didn't really see a lot of result from it. So they're saying, well, before I invest a lot of capital, a lot of resources, a lot of time and effort in the BTB process, the Beyond the Border process, I want to, in the RCC, I really want to see what, where, where they're going. I'm going to make sure this is real. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation here. But the good news is that, and I tell people that the regulators are doing their job. They are communicating. There are work plans there. They are being implemented. Uh, they're, they're pretty much on schedule. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the report, and I'm convinced that, uh, that we're going to see some uh, get to the point in my world where we have a single inspection in Canada is recognized by the U.S. So when I have that inspection by CFIA at Toronto, when that truck crosses the border in the U.S., it just keeps it right on going. It doesn't have to go through another FDA or USDA uh, inspection, and we're getting to that point. So we're excited by this still. We're very encouraged, very supportive. We're very patient. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to the report when it comes out. So with that, I'll stop and we can. That was terrific. I could just listen to you guys all morning. No, don't do that. Don't. <laughs> um, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative just for, for the first question. And it's a related question. And it's about the sustainability of this issue. Um, how can we continue to keep high-level political attention on this when there are so many competing 
uh, uh, demands on, on all of our governments. And I, and I want to focus my question to, to Michael actually on the White House executive order, which I think is very, very important. And if you could just speak sure. a little bit to how that might affect our, our future going forward. And to ask Kelly sort of the same question, but maybe more general terms, what can we do with business, with government, to ensure that two years from now this is not forgotten in a memory? It's a great question, Lauren. It's critical to the continued success of this effort. And again, this effort has the potential, I think, to be the model for many other efforts um, around the world if, if it's successful. I think to, to, to date it's already served uh, as, as a model in some regards. Um, so in the USEU discussions, people are paying attention to what's happening with Canada and the RCC as a potential model. Um, the executive order was uh, a big deal, uh, and I, I mentioned that this was a priority of the prime minister's, and it is, is, by his own words, sort of a top priority. I didn't want to imply that it wasn't a priority of, of this administration's. I think it is. I think it's not a top three priority because we're dealing with, you know, fiscal implosion and, you know, other issues. Um, <laughs> the, the U.S. has, um, you know, some, some really big ticket items that are in front of it. But in the area of international regulatory cooperation, I think it remains a priority and it remains a place that folks want to put scarce resources into. The executive order is an example of that. The, the, for the first time, the president issued a, a directive uh, which, in essence, codified in terms of the family rules of the executive branch his belief that international regulatory cooperation is critical, that in and of itself is important and a step forward, and uh, instituted a series of um, procedural items that encourage and advantage these types of efforts. So uh, it, it used the Regulatory Cooperation Council, that's with small R's and C's, right? So not this one, but the, the model as the preferred uh, methodology or the preferred structure for how one engages in this. Um, if you are a European, you actually notice that because we've had the USEU high-level regulatory cooperation forum for quite a few years, and I, I was the point person for that. And it did not go unnoticed on the European side that this executive order really seemed to be highlighting this model as perhaps opposed to other models as the preferred approach. Uh, and uh, so that will, I think, uh, be noticed in the d negotiations that hopefully will occur in 2013. Uh, the, in, 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 in my, and, and by the way, items that come out of this cooperation council get sort of preferred status through the regulatory process. So one of the items is that when they come into OIRA for review, they kind of float to the top of the pile, and, and, and they are supposed to move through expeditiously. Uh, there's, there's features like that in the executive order that are really signaling to agencies, this is important, this is an administration priority, and when you engage in rulemaking to accomplish the goals of these RCCs, you're going to get a, prefer, a preferred or expedited treatment. Now, my, my, my final point on this is the way you sustain momentum, I think, is, is – threefold. One, uh, you need to continue to have top-down political pressure on the process. So I don't think any of these processes work when there's mid-level, well, that, that's, too, that's too broad a statement because there is cooperation going on at the mid-level. But these ambitious, all the time, but these ambitious efforts I think work much better when the principles of countries, when the leaders of countries say visibly, I care about this and I want it to be done. So on the Canadian side, you have the Prime Minister creating a virtual secretariat to lasso the Canadian regulators and push them, and that is critical. On the U.S. side, you've had President Obama on at least three occasions publicly endorse this, and you have a White House entity that's riding herd over it. That's important, and I've encouraged OIRA to bring those regulators back in around the Truman Room at the White House Conference Center and bring the politicals in and just reiterate in a nice way, but just reiterate, President continues to care about this. We have to deliver. So you have to have that top-down pressure because otherwise the folks down the ranks who are really you know, busy, stressed, may not themselves actually view this as their top priority, can lose sight and motivation sometimes. Second 
is you uh, have to have an opportunity for new work product and new initiatives to flow in. So that gives it perpetuity because there's new items and there's a sense that there's, there's new work to be done. Otherwise, by definition, it's going to have an expiration date. And then third, you have to have enough success and enough uh, potential for stakeholder involvement that all the parties involved maintain faith in the process. So it, it's both sides. The stakeholders have to believe that actual work uh, success can be achieved. It doesn't have to be 100%. If we can bat 800 here, I think we will be ecstatic. Uh, you're not going to hit on every one. But enough success that it's worth it. Uh, and on the regulator side, frankly, they've got to believe that they can achieve success with their counterparts and satisfy stakeholders so that it's worth their time. So those would be, I think, the three, uh, the th the three secrets of success, <laughs> the secret sauce. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Kelly? Laura, again, I, I agree with, with Michael. I would just add one dimension, and it was a frustration of mine with the SPP as well, is that, that there is actually support in Congress for this program. And I would like to see a little bit more legislative engagement uh, in this process. And I'll mention when, when this was announced a year ago, two members of Congress, one Democrat, one Republican, both in the House, came out and endorsed this uh, enthusiastically. Candace Miller, Republican from Michigan, and also Bill Owens, Democrat from New York. And I do think there is a, enormous potential for bipartisan cooperation, engagement, and support for this. I ultimately believe that for this to be successful, it cannot be seen as just a regulatory effort. Inevitably, there's going to have to be some congressional action, because I think there are going to be some regulatory activities. I've already mentioned one, uh, just trying to reorganize our federal food safety agencies in the U.S. It's going to require some congressional activity. I suspect that we're going to need some appropriations for some of these things to occur eventually as well. So I would love to see a little bit more proactive engagement uh, with Congress on the issue. Laura, can I add one point? I completely agree with Kelly. And actually, the more I think about it, the more I think that if these efforts are to mature into ongoing, more ambitious efforts, the low-hanging fruit, and, and it's, it's low, but it's still high enough, right, that people are having to sort of jump off of a ladder to grab it. Um, but, but as we go up the tree, um, now you're going to start getting into issues which didn't make the cut this time, in part because there was a congressional angle. And with, you know, to be honest, when there's a congressional angle, pe people say, well, forget it. I mean, that, that opens up a whole other set of complexities that nobody wants to deal with. If there could be signals and a sense from Congress that they want to play and they want to be productive and they want to help solve some of these problems legislatively, because it requires statutory change oftentimes, now it, it seems to me you open up a whole new world of possibility in terms of the types of initiatives that you would uh, undertake. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to open it up now to questions from the group, and I also want to point out that we have some of the foot soldiers of RCC in the room as well, Eric and Deborah and Bridget and Adam, if anyone of our, our tireless uh, mm -hmm. folks who've been working on this issue um, have, have brief comments as well, we'd love to hear them. Gentlemen in the back. I'm Dave Jones. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. I just wanted to make a comment regarding keeping momentum going. You have an advantage and a disadvantage right now. You have the continued uh, top-level level leadership, so you don't have the NIH syndrome uh, coming into play uh, for getting forward. On the other hand, the disadvantage is that you have the same middle-level managers. And the problem there that I have seen in dealing with complex, complicated negotiations to clear objectives is that the people in the middle indeed get exhausted. They're worn out intellectually. They have lost intellectual creativity. They see the obstacles and not the opportunities. You need to replace them. This is unpleasant to say. It's going to leave feelings bruised by those mid-level people unless you give them a promotion of some sort and an award. But your real answer to move forward is to change the middle-level managers. Thank you. But those folks that are so stressed and overworked have the, the possibility of greatness and the possibility of changing history through the Regulatory Cooperation Council. Do you guys have a comment on that, or shall we move to a? I, I will just mention, you know, one of the things in our company is that we, we have a mantra that 
to win in the workplace, we have to or win a marketplace. We have to win in a workplace. So I think there are, you know, management challenges. I would prefer to say that than trying to replace people. Um, so I think there are no question, and I think it's a constant challenge with distracted uh, folks in the, in the executive branch uh, as there is in Congress on this issue. I think that particularly in the Food Drug Administration, which is very resource strapped at the present time and distracted uh, often happens with some of these agencies that have health and safety responsibilities, uh, major recalls that have occurred both in Canada and the U.S. that distract them. So there's no question there are some management challenges, but um, I wouldn't go quite so far as to replace people. It's not that easy in the executive branch to do that, obviously, having worked in the executive branch many you know, eons ago. But, uh, but there are some management challenges, and it's a constant, uh, and that's why I think Michael's suggestion about making sure that the top-down communication, this is important to the president, continues. Yeah. Others? Sir? Uh, gentleman in the yellow, handsome yellow jacket. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Dave Rabinowitz. Uh, I was wondering about the sustainability of momentum and all that, and I'm wondering how much difference there is between the approach of this current administration and the previous administration, whether that made a difference, and why, if there was a difference, it didn't appear in the campaign, why nobody had heard about it. If you want to maintain momentum, you've got to keep good people in place. Sure. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure there was a difference in approach between this administration and the last. I'll, I'll let others speak to that. I didn't work in the last administration, and frankly, I didn't know a damn thing about international regulatory cooperation <laughs> before 2009, uh, early 2009, when I took my new job. Um, but uh, I, I believe that the prior administration fully supported free trade and, and spent a lot of time um, developing free trade initiatives. So my, my gut would tell me that there's been uh, a continuation of, 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 of emphasis and support. I will say this. I think, and, and I think folks at the chamber and other places have said it, this is one area where um, I, I think the business community has been rightly complimentary of this administration because building off of the work of the prior administration, I think they've continued to push that trend line up. So if there hasn't been a leveling off of or, or decreasing. It has been a trajectory that continues to push up and up. And so uh, I, I think that is, 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 is important. And I think, again, it's because economic imperatives have, have, have instructed folks uh, in this administration that this is a critical area of, 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 of emphasis because you can actually change the economic game in a real way through these initiatives. In terms of sustainability, again, I think we've talked about it. It, it requires um, top-down uh, prioritization. It requires actually at some point adequate resources to keep doing the job. It requires an inflow of good new ideas. Uh, and it requires success to keep people motivated and, and, and keep people uh, buying in to the prospect that this is value-added work. Uh, I, I will say I, I continue to believe, I don't want to be too negative here, I'm, I'm cautious but clearly cautiously optimistic. I continue to believe that this effort has a quite a high potential to be a success, that there are going to be, in another year's time, a, a co collection of real successes that validate the process and a continuation of the process, and then you build out from that. So uh, I, I remain um, you know, generally bullish on the process, but it's going to continue to require, as every ambitious multi-year initiative does, it just requires continued care and attention and, and prodding. Just to add to that, as somebody who was very involved in the Security and Prosperity Partnership, I think this administration and Prime Minister clearly learned some valuable lessons from that process. Uh, it's a very, it's different, it's in, a, in the U.S., it's a, in, in Canada as well, it's organized very differently. And I think the reason that we did not see the success in the SPP was the fact that you had agencies pushing back against the White House, which did not lead this effort. They turned the leadership over to a cabinet secretary, which I thought was a mistake. He, was, he did a great job, did the best he could, uh, but he was the wrong person to really lead this. It re requires White House leadership, which is a lesson that the president clearly learned when this, this, the, they created the Beyond the Border program. So I think the success of Beyond the Border is built on the lessons learned from the Security and Prosperity Partnership. And frankly, much of the work that many of us in the private sector for the SPP 
was brought on. I mean, when we submitted initial comments in April of 2011 to uh, the Department of Commerce on what are some of the barriers, we'd done the work already because of the SPP. So it, it was not thrown out the door. It was just lessons were learned, reorganized, and reshuffled. And also even the Prime Minister. I mean, uh, I remember having a brief discussion with him not long after the SPP basically went away, and he was he did not start the SPP. He came in after it had already well underway. And he said, well, we need to prioritize better. He would also have thought some of the same issues, and, and clearly he has exerted a tremendous amount of leadership and coordination out of the prime minister's office in Canada. So I think both of them learned some of the same lessons, and I think that's why it, that we are optimistic, uh, cautiously or otherwise, about the success of this program eventually. And, and let me just reiterate one point that uh, Kelly made, and I think it is critical because I think it applies to the future success of regulatory cooperation around the globe. And that is, and, and I agree with Kelly, there were lessons learned in terms of top-down leadership, in terms of set deadlines, in terms of getting a political official at each agency to basically endorse that their agency was going to work towards this action plan item and commit to achieving success at the top, okay? And, and those names are written in a piece of paper in a, in a drawer somewhere uh, to, to be removed at some point if needed. But... Uh, I think this question of, of, of centralized leadership is critical. If you look at uh, the relative less success of the U.S.-Mexico Regulatory Cooperation Council to date, and it still could be successful to some degree, but I think you'd have to acknowledge that it, hasn't, it started earlier and hasn't gotten as far to date. If you look at, I'm sad to say, the modest accomplishments, because I was the U.S. lead of the U.S. EU forum uh, over many years. I think one of the problems, one of the commonalities there is that you had uh, leadership, not at the U.S. side, because it's always been the White House and OIRA, but on the other side, uh, residing in one department, ministry, or agency. And if you think about it, that's not intuitively a good model. Apply it to the U.S. Think of the difference between an effort that the president has publicly stated is important and has assigned his regulatory office to oversee. The same regulatory office, mind you, that reviews five to 700 of the most significant rulemakings that come out of that agency in the normal course. And assigning this task to Secretary of Commerce. Now, there, sec, the Department of Commerce is a great institution. There's great people there. But if you think about whether or not you're going to get the EPA administrator to engage on an issue, do you think it's better to have the White House that's reviewing all of their major rules and is acting directly for the president, pushing them and prodding them and pulling them and persuading them to engage on an issue? Or do you think it's better to have basically their brother or sister in the cabinet doing it? It's uh, obvious which is better. And so when you look at Mexico, you have economia that's driving the process from the Mexican side. It's a horizontal agency along with the others. In, in Europe, it's DG Enterprise. Great folks, great leaders, but they're horizontal with DG Sanco and DG Trade. And, and I can't tell you the number of times in which you had Economia or you had DG Enterprise say, we agree with this issue, this sounds great. And by the break at the same meeting, word would come back, well, DG Sanco doesn't agree. Well, darn. You know, we spent a lot of time, that's not the word I used, um, we, we spent a lot of time getting ready for this meeting and having a coordinated administration position, and we had to lasso our agencies together and come up with a position on nano or something else, and then you get in, and you're in, in, these, in, these, in these events, and you suddenly realize that the other side is still fragmented. So I, I truly believe we, we have not seen that with Canada. Okay? If anything, <laughs> they are more motivated even uh, and, and more sort of centrally directed with an imperative. So I, I think that has been, my, I continue to believe that that is a critical ingredient. And as we discuss with the European officials and the U.S. officials what could be achieved in a U.S.-EU economic agreement, one of the key points is they're going to need an RCC that's directed by the President or the Vice President of the United States and the president of the EU or the secretary general, okay, and then it's going to flow down and delegate from there. But you have to start with that top-down centralized leadership. Cool. Yeah. Do we have time for one more question, David? <laughs> one more question or comment. 
Mr. Sands, Dr. Sands, Professor oh, Sands. Uh, Prof <laughs> I call him Chris. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're going to have to answer me later, but I wanted to say something about RCC. And I, in a way, we started with an after working groups talking about regulatory cooperation. Um, so by the end of this new term of the Obama administration, we'll have 24 years of dealing with this. And I started thinking about, well, what if it doesn't get beyond low-hanging fruit? So I mean, what if, what if we're not able to get momentum out of right now, which is, I think, what's most important here, that we have to come out of this first year with real push mm -hmm. to get something good out of the next four years. Mm -hmm. If we don't, what about, well, what about turning it on its head? What if we, I, I, it, in a way, doing the low-hanging fruit reminds me of the sectoral trade agreements we used to have when we were trying to liberalize tariffs. We'd have an auto pact because that was, you know, nicely structured and it was easier, but we didn't do broad, and then we realized we really need to do broad tariff liberalization. What if we said, all right, by 2020, and I made that up, but by 2020, the U.S. will provide, will accept full mutual recognition of Canadian regulatory standards and approvals and vice versa. And then what RCC has to do is adjudicate those agencies that say, oh my God, no, I don't like the Canadian standards. I want to make sure that doesn't happen. And then it's, it's, it's sort of the negative. They're trying to say, let's not liberalize in this area, putting the burden on the agency to say, why not? And then, you know, if it's a serious area, then we begin negotiations on how to eliminate that barrier. The reason I say that is because one of the things that has become you're right about the top-down and centralization, but the other thing that I think we've learned is stakeholder engagement on regulation is more important even than on border, and it's gotten better as we've gone along, but we're still dealing with those people who've got the rule on the table that's being negotiated. And by turning it around and making it a big bang, we get everybody saying, okay, this could be really big for me. No matter where I am in the economy, I see some benefit out of it. Now, I ask that because I think it's a hypothetical, but also because if I think even in the current process, we know that that might be the alternative. It might make people in the regulatory process now realize that it's better to negotiate this way than to have the thing flipped. Be what? like a regulatory sequester. <laughs> yes, a regulatory cliff. <laughs> a regulatory cliff. I mean, I mean, this is in Canada. We call this the big idea, and the big idea is assume alignment, assume harmonization, unless you can show cause for uh, a difference. What do you guys think? In uh, 30 seconds or less. No, I mean, this is, gets back to my point. I mean, it may require a, a, quote, treaty or an act of Congress to do that. I mean, if it's law, then by golly, it's going to happen. And then it does force, there's an action forcing event, kind of like a, if you will, a fiscal cliff or expiring tax provision. So, yeah, I mean, if that's what it takes, and that's what it takes. It requires an enormous amount of, of energy to make that happen, as you know, because agencies will push back if you start giving them deadlines and they don't see a clear path to getting there. But hey, it's an option the business community can consider. And I uh, wouldn't, you know, it's an interesting idea. I think it's a great idea, and I think it's where we're eventually heading. So two, two contexts quickly. Canada. First of all, to give the Canadian effort credit, they have a, a middle version of advanced regulatory cooperation, which is embedded in this. And that is, in addition to solving the 29 transactions, in each case, the regulators have been instructed to identify what caused the problem in the first place and what's a systemic or procedural change that could be made to prevent the same problem from happening again in the same domain. So the idea is we don't want to solve transaction X in this domain and pat ourselves in the back and then transaction Y, Z pop up a year later in the same domain because you haven't fixed the underlying problem. We'll see where folks get, but at least it's a charge towards an advanced level of international cooperation, even within Canada. Now, what you're talking about is something even bigger than that, and that is horizontal reforms that are going to grab sectors, that are going to create horizontal processes that are going to totally shift the way we uh, handle regulatory cooperation. It's almost a negative list idea, okay? Pre presumption of conformity, and then unless there's exceptions. And I would just say, stay tuned on the USEU front, because there's no appetite to engage in an RCC-like effort with Europe, okay? We've done it. You will spend five years solving 20 transactional problems, maybe, and then everyone will be exhausted and walk away. What, what I think the idea is with Europe is to go for the big swing for the fences change, which would be horizontal changes ex ante and ex post um, that would fundamentally shift the way regulators are interacting, okay, and then grab sectors where you can demonstrate functional equivalence, autos, I don't know, 
medical devices or pharmaceuticals, food. There are various areas where we don't think twice about what we do and use in Europe. And then try to have a presumption of conformity with uh, ex exceptions. So I think there may be an opportunity in the US-EU context to actually go for that. And then in Canada, if this all works in a year or two, that would sort of be the next uh, phase. Thank you. And thank all of you for your uh, participation and attention. Thanks to my, my panelists. And David would like to say. Ten minute break. You, you're prompt. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and you. Thank you. Oh, that's right. That's right.